Okay, so what is uh, premature menopause? Well, premature menopause, uh, actually the term is not accurate. Uh, it, it's what most people use to describe the condition because it happens, what happens is young women develop signs and symptoms of, menop of menopause like a 55-year-old woman would develop. In other words, you may have an 18-year-old young lady develop hot flashes, vaginal dryness, and painful intercourse, and no, no menstrual periods. And she'll go to her gynecologist and find out that uh, her FSH levels in the range of a 55-year-old woman who's in menopause. How often does that happen? This happens about 1% of women by age 40. That's, that's incredible. What's the youngest person that you've um, diagnosed with um, premature menopause? We've seen a, a, a child here at age 13. And at 13, she found out that she was in menopause and was not going to be able to have children. Right, only we'd rather call this ovarian insufficiency. See, this was a 13-year-old girl that had an FSH level in the menopausal range, uh, and she had not uh, completed her pubertal development. Uh, but we have evidence that half of these women have intermittent, unpredictable ovarian function. Some of them get pregnant years after the diagnosis. So this is clearly different than menopause. So it's not accurate to tell these women they have menopause because some of them will conceive spontaneously and have a normal, healthy baby after the diagnosis. So what do you tell them? We'd rather call this ovarian insufficiency. The ovary is not working normally, but it clearly may work intermittently and unpredictably. So what's the treatment? Well, the treatment, uh, for, you have to assess a lot of different areas in these women's health uh, because ovarian function plays an important role uh, in women's health. Number one is a reproductive organ, uh, so acutely removing a woman's hopes and dreams of having a baby in the normal way uh, invokes a lot of emotional uh, issues. Uh, and the most common word women use to describe this diagnosis when they get it to us is devastated emotionally. So I, I think the top agenda when you have to give this diagnosis to a young woman is to evaluate her emotional uh, response, inform her about it in, in, a, in a sensitive way, and make sure she has available to her the types of emotional supports to help her process this loss, to work through uh, accepting the diagnosis. Can you reverse it? There's no real proven uh, therapies to make the ovary work normally again. But it is possible to replace the hormones that the ovary make in, in as, as physiologic way as possible to try to mimic how the ovary uh, uh, res does, gives you your own hormones. There are ways for us to give you your hormones that mimic pretty well how the ovary does it. So what symptoms should women be aware of? Well, I think the primary symptom is to keep, take your menstrual cycle seriously, keep a menstrual calendar. And if you see that your menstrual periods are changing in their characteristics where you're missing them or skipping them, uh, then it's time to talk to your doctor about what's the cause of this. And how do you find out if you have perhaps uh, ovarian insufficiency? Well, the way to do this is uh, to measure an FSH level, and you can talk to your doctor to determine if, if they think that's something that should be done. So it's just a simple blood test? It's a simple blood test. Mm -hmm. So are women being mixed diagnosed? Yeah, uh, we have data that over half of our patients see three different clinicians before somebody does a simple blood test to tell that they have this condition. Uh, and that, that's partly because women themselves don't take missing a menstrual period very seriously a lot of times. And also there is a tendency out in the busy clinic to ascribe the loss of periods to stress or maybe dieting or maybe exercising more uh, but, and not really investigating it any further with the appropriate uh, tests. So I think uh, women, if they took their menstrual cycles more seriously, is a sign of one part of their body is working normally and they gave the data to their clinician that this isn't right and they're proactive in finding out why, uh, then I think there'd be less chance of them going two or three years without a diagnosis, which is the average time our patients go. Is there a risk in letting it go undetected and undiagnosed for years? Uh, yeah, the, one of the other uh, things that needs, one of the other risk factors associated with this condition is reduced bone density. You know, estrogen plays an important role in maintaining bone density. And uh, that's, osteoporosis is most commonly uh, diagnosed in postmenopausal women, older women. But if you lose your estrogen uh, production when you're age 13, and that goes unrecognized during your whole teen years, uh, you're going to end up with reduced bone density at the beginning. 
and that will increase your risk of osteoporosis. We've seen, a, we've seen twins here at age 21 who had irregular menstrual periods during their whole teen years that wasn't evaluated and treated, and both of them had bone densities in osteoporotic range, you know, bone density of a 65-year-old woman. Wow, that has to be, a, like you said, a devastating diagnosis for a young woman. So I imagine you have to treat not just her physical health, but her mental health as well. Yeah, this is our... Uh, this is really the primary thing to do first, is, is assess the emotional well-being and get what type of support is there to help her cope with this. Uh, and, then, and then the endocrine, there's endocrine issues also, hormonal issues. Women who have this condition of this type of ovarian insufficiency are at also increased risk of having a thyroid hormone problem and also increased risk of having an adrenal hormone problem. Is there, what's the bottom line? What is, what is the most important message that you think we should get out about this? Because I'm not sure that there's been much written about it or uh, news broadcast about this disorder. I think the most important message is that having menstrual periods in a, each month is a normal part of a young woman's life, and it should be seen as a normal part of a young woman's life. And if that's not happening regularly, then the woman should collect the data and take it to her clinician and find out what's, what's going on here. So you said treat it like a vital sign. Yeah, the menstrual cycle should be viewed more like a vital sign. Just like if you go in and your blood pressure is too high, we do tests to find out why, and we treat it. Well, if your periods aren't coming regularly, get in to see your, your clinician, your doctor, your nurse practitioner, find out why and what treatment should be there. What's the prognosis for women that you've already seen? You said you've seen 1,000 women with this since 1988. How do they do in the long term? Uh, in the long term, they seem to do well. There isn't good hard data on this. There's no long-term studies uh, addressing this in this particular group. But our general sense is once we get their emotional health uh, back on track, or the patients work to get their emotional health back on track, and we get their hormonal replacement uh, where it should be so they're having normal regular menstrual periods and they're not having the symptoms of estrogen deficiency, in the long term, most of them work through the, the family planning issues and decide what's best for them in terms of family building. Some couples will decide that the husband and the wife are the family, and you know, there's no need to add anything to the family. Other couples will go on and do some type of adoption, uh, and they're very happy with that and very satisfied with that. Some couples go a high-tech route and do something like embryo adoption. You know, there's all these frozen embryos out there uh, that couples are willing to donate to a couple with this condition so they can have that embryo implanted and carried uh, to term. Uh, and, and then and they have the normal delivery and, and experience that, and then they raise the child. So that's embryo adoption. Then there's another uh, possibility. It's called egg donation. Uh, this is where women who have normal ovarian function uh, donate eggs so women with this condition of ovarian insufficiency can have those eggs fertilized in a dish in the, in the laboratory and grown to embryos, and then those embryos are transferred to the woman's womb who has ovarian insufficiency, and that implants, and she carries that pregnancy and delivers it at term. So these are all options. The high-tech approach isn't for everybody, uh, but it, is, it does work really well for those that want to do that. Other couples are more uh, satisfied with uh, adoption or calling their family the couple.